Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, all of you. So <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about part two of the helminthic infestation, and we mainly focus on tapeworm infestation today. This is very important from the exam point of view as well as clinical point of view. Now let me start with some introductory lines about the cystode or tapeworms. Now cystode, also known as tapeworms, they are one type of important worms in the classification of helminth. They are ribbon-shaped worms which vary from a few millimeter to several meters in length. They can be quite long. Okay, they can be several meters in length. The adult worms, in case of tapeworm, there are different types of tapeworm. We have got different names. You already know them. Like some some tapeworms are called beef tapeworm, some are called pork tapeworm, some are called fish tapeworm. Okay, different names. So they live in human intestine, where they attach to the epithelium using suckers on the anterior portion. Uh, of their scolex. So they they attach on the uh, mucosa of human intestine and they live there. From the scolex, scolex is uh, just like you know a head part, okay, head region or head part. It arises a series of progressively developing segment which are called proglottids. These proglottids are also known as body segment because yesterday I showed you one table which uh, differentiated between different types of helminth. Okay, then during that time we know tapeworms are segmented, their body is segmented, which are called proglottids. The eggs are consumed by intermediate host, after which they hatch into the larva. Now the same segment has male and female organ. Okay, the same sex is present in that segment. It is, uh, you know, what we call that monoecious, isn't it? Both sex are present in the in the same area, so it is very easy for them to, uh, you know, mate. The eggs are consumed by intermediate host, after which they hatch into the larva. But these eggs are passed into the fecal matter, just like any other roundworm or hookworm. Now, whatever intermediate host they are like. A beef, isn't it? Cattle, I should say, like pig and those type of things. They consume that and then the larva will hatch into the oncosphere. So in this case, the name of the larva is oncosphere. It's a very important term. This oncosphere can penetrate the intestinal wall of the host, that is pig or cattle, and insist in the tissue. They can go in the tissue and form cyst there. Now, man ingests the cyst in undercooked meat or fish. Now, if that infected meat or infected animal is ingested by human being, okay, in undercooked fashion, then the cycle is completed, okay, when the parasite exists in the stomach and develops into adult zones in the small intestine. That's how uh, this parasite enters into the human body. So today, I will talk many times about this life cycle regarding the different types of tapeworms. So this is just the introduction. Now see here, okay? Let me use highlighter and explain to you. Let's start with one, okay? Now see there, so, in the uh, fecal matter, okay, in the fecal matter, these proglottids are passed. Now, these proglottids are called the segmented part of the tapeworm, or these are the body segment of tapeworm. See that? These are a relatively rectangular shape, okay, and sometimes the patient can see them in the stool, and the patient is very frightened to see this type of ribbon shaped structure on their fecal matter and they may report this to the doctor and that's how tapeworm can be diagnosed early now eggs are also passed along with this ribbon like segment 
this is the diagnostic stage of a tapeworm infection so in this uh, stage if stool is collected and studied under microscope we can diagnose the disease now the next step would be this fecal matter has to be consumed okay by these animals cattle in case of tinea cisinata and pig in case of tinea solium now they are infected okay they are infected now what will happen inside them the oncosphere hatch the oncosphere hatch it penetrate the intestinal wall and circulate to musculature now this egg will hatch and the larva come out this larva is called oncosphere so it it has penetrating ability it can penetrate the intestinal wall of these animal and then go to the muscle now this is the cysty circus in the muscle now if that if a human being i should say eat this uh, meat without properly cooking that is raw or undercooked if we properly cook you know these will die but if we eat raw or undercooked meat then from them there i should say it will enter into the gi tract of the human being and inside the intestine they will become adult and look at the adult how long it is exactly like ribbon like structure very long this is a scolex okay this scolex get attached on the surface of the intestine and the body will be prolonged so this is how uh, you know life cycle of tapeworm would be completed now one small point before i go further look at this eye okay they will love to ask this type of question to you in mcq exam or in viva exam d is the diagnostic form a stage and i is the infective stage of tapeworm so the infective stages are oncosphere which are developed into cysty cerci of the muscle so these particular animals if we eat this animal meat undercooked or raw and if they have oncosphere inside the muscle then we get the disease now with this information let's talk about tinea cisinata what are the important points now tinea cisinata is called beef tapeworm is common in all countries where undercooked beef is eaten so there are lots of countries in the world where beef is quite a uh, very common type of meat so tinea cisinata can be seen everywhere the adult worm causes few if any symptom it doesn't you know cause much symptoms like tinea solium i'll explain the reason why because in tinea solium okay it usually leads to cystic sarcosis and neurocystic sarcosis because of its special ability but in case of tinea cisinata those things are not seen that's why uh, tinea cisinata is considered not that serious type of infestation now infection or inf infestation is usually discovered when proglottids are found in feces or on underclothing often causing considerable anxiety to the patient i already told you in the fecal matter if they see ribbon like structure or those proglottids they definitely go to the doctor okay because this is not a they have never seen that type of thing before sometime even on the undergarment okay they will see this type of ribbon like structures then diagnosis would be easy for the doctors and diagnosis is done by stool examination Now, infection can be cleared with a single dose of praziquantel which is 10 mg per kg this is a specific drug which we use to treat this type of uh, beef tapeworm infestation and it can be prevented by careful meat inspection or by thorough cooking of the beef now we are entering into the most important part of this lecture that is tinea solium <clears throat> if any question comes from here it comes from tinea solium part now they are called pork tapeworm they are generally smaller than tinea cisinata or beef tapeworm although they can still reach 6 meters in length a very interesting data our small intestine is also 6 meter in 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 length 
so it can fill the whole small intestine there as with tinea cisinata infection okay it is usually asymptomatic means the adult tapeworm disease can be asymptomatic but the problem is cysticercosis okay this cysticercosis can be formed in different muscle it can even go to the central nervous system and can lead to a lot of manifestation now how we get this infestation this is by okay see here eating undercooked pork okay undercooked pork while cysticercosis follows the ingestion of egg from contaminated food and water now this is a little bit confusing for the student so let me take a little bit of time and explain this to you now, there are two types of problem here one okay let me use the pointer or highlighter see here now there are two types of uh, you know uh, tinea solium problem one the adult tapeworm disease they are mainly acquired by eating undercooked pork well as cysticercosis or neurocysticercosis is acquired by eating okay or ingesting the egg from contaminated food and water so so one very important sentence now even the person who has never consumed pork okay for example muslim they never eat pork okay and so many other people they also don't like to eat pork so they also can get neurocysticercosis by ingesting the egg if the food and water is contaminated i'm not talking about the adult tapeworm disease okay i'm talking about neurocysticercosis now so don't be surprised if someone develop neurocysticercosis when they have never eaten pork in their life because this is the mechanism now let's move on now some very uh, important fact here patient with tapeworm or adult tapeworm they do not usually develop cysticercosis and patient with cysticercosis they do not usually harbor the tapeworm now we need to think about this statement for a moment so what does it what does it mean patient with adult tapeworm okay they do not usually develop cysticercosis now let me explain why this adult tapeworm okay they pass their egg on the stool now from the stool it will go into the pig okay the pig will consume that that type of uh, you know material that that stool which has contaminated their food or their vegetables or whatever then it will go into the pig's body now from the intestine of that pig it will go to pig muscle okay if human being consume that particular meat okay without cooking it then they can get adult tapeworm disease so there is no point of neurocysticercosis here this is very clear but if someone consumes vegetable and food or even water okay which are which are contaminated by the egg the egg of the tinea solium now this egg okay are very very important point here this egg when we consume them when we they go into our intestine they develop into oncosphere now this oncosphere remember they can penetrate the intestine and go to the blood and from the blood they can easily enter into the muscle and into the central nervous system that's how neurocystosis neurocysticercosis occurs following the ingestion of the egg the larva are liberated i'm talking about the human being now they penetrate the intestinal wall because they have a special ability they have a hook on their head they are called oncosphere are carried to the various part of the body through the blood where they develop into cysticercae cysticercae means cyst form they are the cyst form now these cysts are 0.5 to 1 cm in diameter they are not that big and they contain the scolex of a new adult worm 
scolex is the start point it is the head of the womb from where all the body will will uh, develop later on okay if it reaches the intestine the common sites for cysti cerca include subcutaneous tissue skeletal muscle and the brain now everything whatever i am talking till now is again repeated in this slide so i want you to focus clearly here okay this is important point now see here so again let's start from number 1 there is adult tapeworm adult tapeworm which is inside the human body that adult tapeworm has passed the egg or gravid proglottids in the fecal matter and then uh, it is in the external environment now these things are taken by see this pig isn't it embryonic egg and are gravid proglottids ingested by pig okay now let's talk one thing at a time okay let's only pick pig now for the time being now what will happen inside the pig or that pork the oncosphere hatch okay? they penetrate the intestinal wall of that pig and circulate in the muscle now if a human being consume that meat or muscle okay without properly cooking then they can get adult tapeworm disease so many times i have explained that to you now let's talk how neurocystic sarcosis or cystic sarcosis occur in the human being now see there this stage stage is the same now this pig do not take that egg now these eggs are taken by the human being and how because of contaminated food and water consumption the pig doesn't come into the picture here those eggs are contaminating food and water and human being is taking them so they will directly go into our intestine and into the intestine okay they can penetrate they can go into the muscles and nervous system of human being and then they can cause neurocystic sarcosis you can clearly see there in this picture see here this oncosphere if it reaches the brain we call it neurocystic sarcosis it can even reach the eye okay cases have been reported it has caused blindness also it can reach spinal cord as well and it can cause paraplegia if it reaches the spinal cord and very commonly it can reach different muscles it can reach subcutaneous tissue as well and can cause a small swelling there so all these are very very important point now with this information okay let's move further now, superficial cyst in case of cystic sarcosis may be felt under the skin but usually they cause no significant symptom now, i like to highlight something more here so sometime this cystic sarcosis or small cyst under the skin can be confused with other diseases which also cause similar type of problem now in case of rheumatic fever okay listen this question in case of rheumatic fever out of those five major criteria which one is a differential diagnosis of the cystic sarcosis now yes which one anyone erythema marginatum no not erythema marginatum because we are talking about swelling now okay so which one swelling in the skin cutaneous nodules sub cutaneous nodules remember out of five criteria okay one is carditis another is arthritis third erythema marginatum four sidenham scoria and five sub cutaneous nodules now these sub cutaneous nodules can be confused with cystic sarcosis which is present under the skin this is important differential diagnosis another one is rheumatoid nodule even rheumatoid arthritis which is a systemic connective tissue disorder can lead rheumatoid nodule and that can be another differential diagnosis of cystic sarcosis under the skin another example i can give is neurofibroma this is a tumor which is uh, present on the skin neurofibroma okay so these are these can be considered some of the differential diagnosis so you should be careful 
cyst in the brain can cause a variety of problem including seizure personality change hydrocephalus and focal neurological sign now our discussion will shift on neurocystic sarcosis and these are the multiple problem which these parasites are leading and one very interesting point is this may only appear many years after the infection so sometimes patient even don't know when they got this uh, uh, neurocystic sarcosis disease or when when they consume that uh, you know contaminated food or water now one very important point i like to highlight here see most of us live in uh, ichun isn't it during our study or teaching profession now all chinese people they eat pork this is their most common type of meat so though we do not consume pork in that particular situation or environment we take vegetables all the time okay we drink water from that type of environment or situation so please be careful but whatever you take you need to wash it very carefully and cooked very properly if somehow those vegetables or food or any water source is contaminated with the egg of these a tapeworm we can have neurocystic sarcosis disease now with this information let's talk about neurocystic sarcosis in detail this is the most common parasitic disease of the nervous system the most common parasitic disease of nervous system and it's the main cause of acquired epilepsy in developing country this is a very important point main cause of acquired epilepsy in developing country now let me tell you one case scenario immediately a young person around 25 year old came to the hospital with seizure okay with seizure now you are taking the history how many times the seizure occurred in the past and they, the family said many times and you ask what was the type of the seizure they say only one half of the body was seizing that time so this is a partial seizure and during this type of cases the first thing listen it the first diagnosis which comes in our mind it may be a case of neurocystic sarcosis okay especially if we are from that type of environment i mean the environment which is a lot of pigs here and there people are you know growing those pigs for their sake so only in that situation we think about it for example in in the patient is from that place where pigs are not present at all then you don't think about neurocystic sarcosis as the first diagnosis so this is a very important knowledge another point neurocystic sarcosis can be acquired via fecal oral contact with carriers of adult tapeworm tinea solium now till now i'm sure every student has understood how neurocystis neurocystis sarcosis occur okay this is the way we have to consume egg then only it can happen now this indicate the presence of a tapeworm carrier in the immediate environment that means inside the household or by accidental ingestion of contaminated food that's what i am explaining if we get neurocystic sarcosis we we get from this way this is the mechanism now there are very few cases of auto ingestion okay auto ingestion means the person with tinnitus or adult tapeworm disease may ingest the egg of tinea solium into their intestine and this type of cases have been reported for example from the anal canal or anal region you know somehow their hand is contaminated with those egg and those hand okay are probably the person is eating some food during that time and eggs are again going into the intestine now the the intermediate host is not involved here the pig is not involved at all and this is how neurocystis neurocystis sarcosis can also occur but just think about how common it is okay this is not common at all maybe only few cases can occur like this
Now, what are the clinical features of neurocystic sarcosis? Let's talk about it. It's a pleomorphic disease, means multiple uh, types or multiple variations of clinical features are there. But sometimes, okay, in the early situation, it may be asymptomatic as well. Now, that pleomorphism or number of variability is because of location of the lesion, number of parasite, and the host immune response. Now, let me explain quickly about this point here. Now, it depends. It depends on where inside the brain the cysticercosis is located. If it is in the frontal lobe of the brain, some other types of symptoms should be there. If it is in the parietal lobe or occipital lobe, some other symptoms should be there. It depends on the function of that area of the brain. It also depends how many parasites are present there. If there are many, multiple, they can lead to a lot of problems. They can cause inflammation there. It can lead to cerebral edema. It can lead to raise intracranial pressure. It can lead to seizure. Okay, a lot of problems. And third point, it also depends on host immune response. If immune response is good, probably those parasites would be killed quite early, along with the help of medicine. Now, epilepsy is the most common presentation. Now, can anybody tell me what is epilepsy? What is epilepsy, by the way? Yes? Complete or partial. Yes, Samad. Uh, yes. Ab abnormal. So, seizure greater than 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay, so different answers okay. are coming. Yes, 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 please. Abnormal impulses arise in the brain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, <laughs> yes, Taiva. Yeah, you want to say something? <clears throat> yes. Generalized tonic clonic contractions, abnormal, abnormal contraction of muscles. Okay. Now listen carefully. So you all are answering the meaning of seizure here. Okay. Seizure and epilepsy. There is a slight difference between them. Now seizure means somehow. There is excessive electrical discharge generated inside our brain, and that electrical discharge is okay now spread all over the body. Sometimes it may be only one side of the body, and sometimes you know all over the body. This is called seizure. Seizure can be of different type: motor seizure, sensory seizure, isn't it? Sometimes autonomic seizure, and sometimes even psychic type of seizure. Now, what is epilepsy? If okay, two or more type of seizure or two or more episode, I should say, rather than type, two or more episodes of seizure if occur in the same person without any provocation, this is called epilepsy. So epilepsy is a chronic type of seizure disorder. Okay, let's make it very simple. Chronic type of seizure disorder is called epilepsy. So what is happening here? In this case now, the epilepsy can be the most common presentation. Almost 70% of the neurocystic sarcosis uh, patient can have epilepsy. Now, seizures secondary to neurocystic sarcosis may be generalized or partial. Generalized means whole body is affected and the most common type of generalized seizure is generalized tonic-clonic seizure, also known as grand mal seizure. Now see here, generalized seizure is usually tonic-clonic or grand mal type. Whole body is shaken and there is spasm and usually the person will lose the consciousness. This generalized seizure is related to presence of multiple lesions inside the brain. Only one lesion probably cannot lead generalized seizure. Okay, you need multiple parasites inside the brain. So more common one is the simple and partial complex type of seizure. Now, first of all, you should understand what is partial seizure. Only one part of the body is having seizure, not the whole. Okay, this is partial seizure. Simple means the person is still 
conscious he is not unconscious whereas complex partial seizure means along with the seizure <clears throat> the consciousness level is decreased now this is called complex partial seizure now third one may be focal seizure with secondary generalization in the beginning it was focal or partial seizure later on it is complicated into tonic clonic or generalized seizure so this is also a component of partial seizure because in the beginning it began as a partial one so these are different types of seizure which occur in epilepsy in case of neurocystic sarcosis let's move on now one of the common clinical feature is headache now headache okay can be caused by different mechanism here one of the commonest mechanism for headache is raised intracranial pressure this raised intracranial pressure is because of space occupying lesion inside the brain now think about this cystic sarcosis or cystic sarcosis this is a small mass lesion which is growing into our brain even one of those lesion okay can cause a lot of problem then we can easily understand uh, how multiple lesions like that can cause the problem okay so they can cause raise intracranial pressure and that can lead headache sometime they can also lead to hydrocephalus now we all know what is the shear shear flow pathway if that mass or that lesion is blocking the cerebral aqueduct of sylvius it can easily lead to hydrocephalus if multiple neurocystic sarcosis lesion are okay blocking all the shear shear pathway here and there hydrocephalus can occur easily it can again lead to raise in intracranial pressure and headache now sometimes patient presents only with headache so we call it chronic headache and it may simulate migraine as well now migraine is a very common type of primary headache in migraine there is a photophobia and phonophobia okay the person is sensitive to light and sound and the headache will last for up to 3 days it has a very strong family history so multiple points are there in migraine sometimes it may be confused with the migraine as well now another important clinical feature is raise icp which i already talked but let's let's revise once again because this is a very important part of this topic this raise icp is also known as intracranial hypertension it is due to obstruction of shear shear circulation okay or because of cerebral edema obstruction of shear shear circulation or because of cerebral edema now see there it may also result from large cyst which displace the midline structure or by causing cystic sarcotic encephalitis this is extensive inflammation of the brain which is caused by this parasite that's why we use the term cystic sarcosis encephalitis let me underline this okay so these are uh, different causes of raise icp or intracranial hypertension now the affected patient because of this raise icp may have seizure this seizure the most common type are partial seizure but generalized seizure can also occur and their mental status will be low they may become drowsy in the beginning stupor in the middle or comatose later on diplopia may also occur diplopia means double vision okay this double vision is occurring because of involvement of cranial nerve 3 4 and 6 because these are the cranial nerve which supply extra ocular muscles in the eye okay uh, there are different muscles so if any of this nerve is not working those muscles are paralyzed and our eyeball cannot move in the proper direction leading to double vision or diplopia the most common nerve among them is sixth cranial nerve or abducens nerve which is affected and the muscle supplied by abducens nerve is lateral rectus so that is the most common muscle 
which is affected by this type of problem. Okay, <clears throat> so let's continue after the break. We are talking about clinical features of neurocystic sarcosis. Now, right now, we are talking about intracranial hypertension or raised ICP. Now, this raised ICP can be caused by different mechanisms. One of that is hydrocephalus, that means obstruction of shear shift flow. Another is cerebral edema, which can be caused by cystic encephalitis. And that can happen because of a large number of parasites, which are causing problem inside the brain. Now, what type of uh, problem occur in raised intracranial pressure? Now, remember, raised intracranial pressure is a condition okay so it can have a lot of other manifestation like seizure like decrease in mental status the person may be drowsy or stupor or even in coma at the same time there may be draw double vision okay double vision or blurring of the vision and that double vision or diplopia is mainly caused by involvement of the third fourth or sixth cranial nerve the most common one uh, was is a sixth cranial nerve, which is abducens nerve, and sixth cranial nerve supply lateral rectus muscle. That's why uh, there is diplopia uh, because of the involvement. Now let's move on. Another important clinical feature in case of neurocystic sarcosis is stroke. Okay, now how and why stroke occurs? Now, these strokes are mainly ischemic complication of neurocystic sarcosis. They are ischemic complication. Now, how ischemia occurs here, we should understand. Okay. Now, what is happening because of raised ICP, because of cerebral edema, okay, some of the blood vessels in that involved area would be compressed. Okay. And another important reason we can give the direct compression by cystic sarcosis itself. For example, deep inside the brain, the cystic sarcotic lesion is there, which is giving compression to one small blood vessels, which is supplying important area of the brain. This is uh, the perfect explanation for stroke. These strokes may be responsible for paresis or plasia, involuntary movement, gait disturbances, or paresthesia. Now, let me explain this term for you. Paresis means partial weakness. Plagia means dense weakness. Now, partial weakness, okay? On the scale of five, on the scale of five, if the person is having three to four grade of weakness, we call that paresis. But if the person doesn't have any power at all, zero, one, or two, we call that plagia. This, this uh, is from the examination of central nervous system involuntary movement may be there okay gait disturbance may be there especially if cerebellum is involved and paresthesia means tingling and numbness sensation in the periphery this is because of involvement of sensory nervous system now another one is a neuropsychiatric dysfunction now it may range from poor performance okay to severe dementia because the brain is getting affected especially if frontal lobe of the brain is affected by this neurocystic sarcotic lesion, then neuropsychiatric dysfunction can occur very commonly. Now, dementia means loss of memory. Now, hydrocephalus is another important problem. Hydrocephalus. Both type of hydrocephalus can occur in this condition, communicating as well as non-communicating. Now, Every student know what's the difference between these two. So communicating hydrocephalus means the CSF absorption site is mainly affected. And that CSF absorption site is arachnoid villi or granulation. Okay, villi or granulation. Now see here, so let me highlight it for you. So see this, communicating hydrocephalus is due to inflammation and fibrosis of arachnoid villi mm -hmm or arachnoid granulation and uh, what happens sometime 
there are lots of neurocystic sarcotic lesion at that area they will cause extensive inflammation and they'll block that absorption site okay so that can easily lead to communicating hydrocephalus now this is around 10 to 30 percent of the patient another type may be non-communicating hydrocephalus it may be caused by obstruction to the flow area of CSF. That obstruction may be in foramen of Monroe, that obstruction may be in cerebral aqueduct, or that obstruction may be somewhere else. But there is clear cut, no communication between ventricular system and the subarachnoid space. So this is called non-communicating hydrocephalus. Both types may occur. Now, what else? What are the other clinical features of neurocystic sarcosis? Spinal neurocystic sarcosis can also happen. This is involvement of the spinal cord by neurocystic sarcosis. Now, involvement of the spinal cord may be inside the cord material or outside. Intramedullary means it has gone into the cord substance of spinal cord. Extramedullary, it is giving pressure from outside what happens okay see this carefully the extra medullary form is the most frequent and is responsible of symptoms of spinal dysfunction such as radicular pain weakness and paresthesia now if spinal cord is compressed from outside okay if it is compressed from outside those spinal root which are coming out are compressed and that will give rise to radicular pain. This radicular pain means in one particular dermatome, there is severe pain, there is shooting like pain, which is going, you know, distally in case of limb, okay, and going probably lateral wise in case of body. So, this is radicular pain. Weakness of the muscle can occur if motor neurons are compressed. For example, see ventral root, if it is compressed, ventral root is carrying motor fiber and dorsal root is carrying sensory fiber and spinal nerve is carrying both of them it's very easy to explain paresthesia is the sensory symptom now what happens if intramedullary lesion is there it may cause paraparesis now paraparesis means the lower limbs are paralyzed okay both lower limbs are paralyzed right as well as left paresis means partial paralysis plagia means dense paralysis we already talked about there may be sensory deficit with the level now let me explain this by giving you one important example if at the level of t10 vertebra at the level of t10 vertebra if there is neurocystic sarcosis at spinal cord. Now what will happen? All the sensation below that T10 level is gone. Okay, they are absent. But above that level of T10, everything is normal. So this is called level. Okay, level uh, in case of spinal cord. This is important uh, when we talk about sensation or sensory problem. Now, another important thing which is happening here is a sphincter disturbance. Okay. A sphincter disturbance means urine and stool cannot be controlled because the sphincter is not working properly because of the involvement of spinal cord. So this can lead to incontinence. Incontinence. Incontinence means unable to hold stool as well as urine. Okay. So all these uh, can happen because of spinal neurocystic sarcosis. Now, I already told you, it can even go inside the eye. So ocular cystic sarcosis can be one of the presentation in the patient. And the most common site is subretinal space. And uh, what happens to the patient now? It presents with ocular pain. Okay. It presents with decreased visual acuity, means decreased vision. Now the patient cannot see properly. Another problem is visual field defect. The person cannot see broad field of the vision. 
their field of vision is narrowed down or they may occur a cause blindness in one eye blindness in one eye that is monocular blindness one side blindness is more common than the both but both eye blindness can also happen cases have been reported so this is about spinal and ocular cystic sarcosis okay now before i move further let me revise what are the important clinical feature of neurocystic sarcosis once again many students are joining still so they should also know so one is okay one is epilepsy this epilepsy is a very very important clinical feature and this epilepsy means repeated seizure repeated unprovoked seizure so they may be partial seizure they may be generalized tonic clonic seizure okay or they may be partial seizure to start with and become generalized seizure later on another is headache okay headache headache is a very important feature in case of neurocystic sarcosis another may be because of raised intracranial pressure or because of intracranial hypertension there may be blurring of the vision there may be decreased mental status and there may be diplopia these are very important feature another one okay another one may be stroke there may be ischemic stroke okay ischemic stroke because of uh, blockage of the blood flow to a particular area of the brain another may be hydrocephalus okay hydrocephalus it may be communicating or non communicating hydrocephalus some sensory problem may occur and spinal neurocystic sarcosis can also occur which results in weakness of the lower limb radicular pain okay tingling and numbness and sometimes even incontinence of stool and urine and the last one it can go even inside the eye which can lead to pain in the eye decreased vision visual field defect as well as blindness so this is how we discuss about the uh, clinical feature of neurocystic sarcosis now let's move on now another important part is differential diagnosis of neurocystic sarcosis so what are the differential diagnosis now see here brain abscess is one of the important differential diagnosis of neurocystic sarcosis brain abscess now why brain abscess is considered as the differential diagnosis the reason is very simple brain abscess is also a space occupying lesion just like neurocystic sarcosis it can also lead to seizure okay it can also cause raise icp and lead to problem brain stem glioma same reason this is a brain tumor now glioma are type of tumor cerebral amebiasis this is you know presence of amoeba inside the central nervous system even in time by histolytica can go there and sometimes different type of amoeba can damage our brain like neglaria fowleri and acanth amoeba neglaria fowleri and acanth amoeba are a special type of amoeba which can directly damage the brain but even in time by histolytica can go inside the brain okay the cases have been reported central nervous system tumor the different example i can give are astrocytoma astrocytoma important tumor one of the important example is glioblastoma multiforme so let me write that name for you okay it is important you know term glioblastoma multiforme glioblastoma multiforme okay glioblastoma multiforme this is a type of uh, astrocytoma which is the most malignant one now cns toxoplasmosis it occurs in immunocompromised people like aids when toxoplasma multiply inside the brain it also leads to space occupying lesion cns cryptococcosis now cryptococcus neoformans is a type of fungus 
which also cause infection in severely immunocompromised people. Again, the example can be given in AIDS people. Craniopharyngioma. Okay, craniopharyngioma. Now, this craniopharyngioma is a benign tumor, okay, which occurs inside the cranial cavity, and this originates from rat cage pouch. Rat cage pouch is an embryological structure from where pituitary gland would be originated, especially the anterior pituitary gland. So this tumor also can behave in the same way. Neurosarcoidosis, one of the type of sarcoidosis which can affect our central nervous system. And remember, sarcoidosis is granulomatous condition. So sarcoid can be formed inside the brain, which can lead to similar type of problem. Pituitary tumor. Pituitary gland is also present inside the cranial cavity. Any pituitary tumor can cause raise ICP. Tuberculous meningitis, very important differential diagnosis. It can lead to meningitis as well as tuberculoma. This tuberculoma are also space occupying lesion. Now, tuberculosis of the central nervous system, okay, the similar type of situation actually, and carotid disease and stroke. Now, it can lead to stroke also. So the thrombus formation in the carotid artery and ischemic stroke can be other differential diagnosis. So these are the differential diagnosis of neurocystic sarcosis. They are quite you know, variable. So many different types of condition may be there. Now, after going through all these things, let's try to confirm the disease. What investigation we like to do? Now, in this case, some of the important investigations are highlighted here, like CT scan and MRI. The CT and MRI are always done, either CT or MRI, okay, not both. First, we go for CT scan. If it is not confirmatory, then probably MRI will be done. Now, apart from CT, we can go for CBC, complete blood count, and that CBC may show peripheral leukocytosis, okay, peripheral leukocytosis let me highlight this underline i should say peripheral leukocytosis eosinophilia and even esr can be high raise esr now this eosinophilia can pinpoint against parasitic infection okay so this is one important clue now this is involvement of the brain so we can go for lumbar puncture and CSF evaluation or analysis. So what finding we get if we examine CSF? There will be mononuclear pleocytosis. Now pleocytosis means increased cells in the CSF. And these are mainly mononuclear cell. That means mainly lymphocyte. Normal or low glucose level. Elevated protein level because of inflammation and there is high immunoglobulin G level in the CSF. So these are the different CSF findings. Apart from them, even eosinophilia, okay, eosinophilia may be present in the CSF. And this tells us this may be caused by neurocystic sarcosis. But even in tuberculosis, sometime eosinophilia may be present in the CSF. But more common is definitely neurocystic sarcosis. Okay. Now let's move on. The tinnitus and neurocystic sarcosis coexist in 10 to 15 percent of the patient with neurocystic sarcosis. Now tinnitus means adult tapeworm disease. Neurocystic sarcosis means brain involvement. Now so many times I told you, most commonly either you have either you have adult tapeworm disease or you have neurocystic sarcosis, but not the both. So in rare type of situation, these may coexist together. Okay, So it is quite a you know, rare type of situation, but it can happen. And see there, in this situation, we should identify the tapeworm carrier by examining the stool of the relative of a patient with cystic sarcosis encephalitis. Who knows, inside the family, there is adult tapeworm carrier in that case. And that person may be, okay, that person may be uh, contaminating food and water inside the household environment. 
So other people are ingesting the egg. And sometimes the same person may also lead auto okay, infection. Auto infection it is called. From the anus or anal canal area or perianal area, okay, the hands are contaminated and then the person can ingest that. So this is called auto infection. Very rare type of mechanism, but it can happen. Now, another type of investigation which we do is ELISA, the enzyme linked immunosorbent assay of CSF. And this ELISA will find antibody against this tinea solium. It has a sensitivity of 50% and a specificity of 65% for neurocystic sarcosis. Not that high, okay? If, if it is high, that would be better, but nevertheless, it is one of the options. ELISA of serum also can be done. This detects antibody against the parasite. Now we are reaching to one very important area of the uh, discussion, okay? That is CT scan of the brain. We have already listed CT is the important investigation, but what we get in CT scan of the brain? Now, CT scan is one of the most important investigation here. It is always done and it can give us the diagnosis actually. Now, depend on the stage of evolution of the infection the findings are variable what does that mean those larval form which are present inside the brain may be in the different stages. so according to the stage the different findings may be there like vesicular stage in this condition there is viable larva larva is still okay live there it is not dead so hypodense area is seen and non enhancing lesions are seen. Now, this is a special term in CT scan hypodense and hyperdense. Now, hyperdense means density is lesser than the normal brain, and hyperdense means density is more than the normal brain. Okay, so remember this. Now, another stage may be larval degeneration stage, which is called colloidal stage. In this case, hypodense or isodense lesions. Are seen and there is peripheral enhancement and perilesional edema. I have, I have included a few uh, CT so we can see them now. Nodular granular stage in another one, okay. In this condition, the nodular enhancing lesion are seen. Cystic sarcotic encephalitis, there is diffuse cerebral edema which will cause compression of the ventricle, okay. This is quite typical. Active parenchymal stage is another one where even the scolex inside the cyst can be seen. Now, the scolex okay, is the responsible okay, part for the growth of the organ. Remember, so it is it is appeared as a hyperdense dot inside the cyst. And one more is calcified stage when the parasite dies, okay, calcification occurs. So these are different you know finding which can be seen by ct scan of the brain and see here okay this is very uh, interesting so this is ct scan of the brain now these are the ventricles isn't it we all know now look look here this area this is called ring enhancing lesion and if you see it very carefully we can see a, a white dot Okay, a hyperdense white dot inside this cyst like appearance. So, probably this is a scolex here. So, this is a very active type of lesion. Another one, see here. Now, I cannot see any, any other structure here. So, it looks a calcified lesion. Calcified lesion looks very bright white, okay, both on x ray as well as CT. So, this is a calcified spot now. Okay, this is one of the uh, manifestations in CT. So another one, so see there, according to the different stages, different radiographic evaluation is done. This is vesicular stage, vesicular, still the active form. Okay. Now, this is how the edema looks like, edema, and there is a lesion right at the center. Okay. This is called colloidal lesion. Okay. This is also known as colloidal lesion and ring enhancing lesion, very, very important term. Okay. This is granular granular 
as well as colloidal. The red red arrow is colloidal. Okay, the green arrow is granular, which is nicely written here. And this is calcified. So these are the different stages of the parasite inside the brain. Now, one very important point I like to highlight here before we move further is ring enhancing lesion. Okay. Now let me go a little bit backward. Look at this this uh, you know picture here. This is called ring enhancing lesion. Now, what do you mean by that? So in the beginning, we go for plain CT scan. Plain CT scan do not show ring enhancing lesion. So we have to give contrast material and then take the CT scan again. Now, if there is a space occupying lesion inside the brain, that contrast material will go and deposit around this lesion, which exactly looks like a ring, okay? A ring surrounding that lesion. We call that ring enhancing lesion. There are lots of causes for ring enhancing lesion. Or a lot of differential diagnoses are there. Any space occupying lesion inside the brain can lead to ring enhancing lesion. Now, a student can tell me easily. Can you tell me what are those ring enhancing lesion now? Any example you know? Brain abscess. Very good. One is brain abscess. Another? Brain tumor. Another is brain tumor. Third? Neurocystic sarcosis, which you are talking right now. Fourth, blood clot, which is called hematoma. Okay, hematoma inside the brain. Another is tuberculoma, okay, tuberculoma, a granuloma formed inside the brain. So, all of these can be differential diagnosis of neurocystic sarcosis. That, that slide, which you still remember, those are the points. So, CT scan may show similar type of lesion. So, we need to need the help of other investigation. Now, the final part is the treatment or the management. Now, treatment of neurocystic sarcosis depends upon the viability of the cyst and its complication. Now, it depends whether that uh, uh, cyst is still viable, means it's still living or already dead. And whether it has caused complications or not. So we can easily divide our management into two parts, symptomatic and supportive treatment, okay, symptomatic and supportive treatment, as well as definitive treatment, which is directed against the parasite. So always treatment is, uh, you know, discussed in these two different headings. Now, if the patient is having seizure, okay, now we give anti seizure medicine or anti epileptic drug. This is a symptomatic management now. If the patient is having raised ICP, we give certain drug to decrease the raised ICP, like mannitol. Okay, mannitol is one of the important drugs, like dexamethasone, another important drug. So these can be considered as a symptomatic treatment here. Now, if the parasite is dead, if the parasite is dead, okay, what we do now? we mainly focus on uh, symptomatic and supportive treatment, like anticonvulsants are given for the management of seizure. And these are mainly partial seizure, so carbamazepine or sodium valproate may be a good choice. In the beginning, you choose only one drug, which is called monotherapy, okay? And later on, if it, if it is not helping, then you add the drug. This is the a way by which we treat seizure. The calcification, which will remain there for a long time, remains an epileptogenic focus inside the central nervous system. So repeated seizure may come even after the treatment of the condition. Now, if the if the larva is still viable or is still living or active now what are we going to do we need to kill it isn't it so uh, anti helminthic drugs are prescribed okay, so let's let's uh, you know talk in a bit detail here if the parasite is viable or active and the patient has vasculitis arachnoiditis or encephalitis all are inflammatory condition 
a course of steroid or immunosuppressant is recommended before the use of anti cysty circle drug now let me explain this once again if you kill that parasite or the larval form or cysty sarcotic form which is present inside the brain okay some chemical substance would come out and they can cause intense inflammatory reaction there so we need to control this with corticosteroid okay along with those medicine now in april 2 2013 american academy of neurology has issued some guideline and that has recommended use of alvendazole plus a corticosteroid for the treatment of parenchymal neurocystic sarcosis okay so you already know the name of the medicine alvendazole with corticosteroid this is a very very important uh, you know treatment now what is the dose okay in adult 400 mg twice daily okay in children okay half of that for 8 to 20 days plus dexamethasone or prednisolone these are the example of corticosteroid to decrease the number of active lesion on brain imaging and reduce the long term seizure frequency if we give corticosteroid it doesn't allow to cause intensive inflammation without inflammation okay the long term seizure frequency is going to be reduced now alternative drug okay for alvendazole is praziquantel now praziquantel can be given in the place of alvendazole and it is given in 50 mg per kg per day in divided doses for 15 days now what's the role of surgery okay surgery has got a definite role for example the patient presents with hydrocephalus there is a neurocystic sarcotic lesion inside the ventricles of the brain okay which is causing obstruction we have to go for okay shunt this is vp shunt ventricular peritoneal shunt for the treatment everybody know that and uh, this should be followed by surgical removal of the cyst and subsequently medical treatment all those anti seizure medicines and whatever necessary we can give later on in case of multiple cyst in the subarachnoid space which is called racemose form this is a term which we use surgical extirpation and urgent basis is recommended you destroy all the cyst by surgery okay this is a type of treatment and in case of ocular or spinal lesion we also require surgical management because they are considered emergency condition if you know spinal cord if if a cystic sarcotic lesion is there it will cause paraplegia or paraparesis incontinence okay a lot of problem and in the eye it can cause you know visual loss okay or vision loss so we should be careful 